Elder Diane has been with us for, wow, how many years? A spell. A spell. <laughs> a, a, yeah, almost 20 years. And uh, she and I dug holes, planted trees, bushes, and uh, for a while she was over outside maintenance and she raised up our children, taught them the word of God. And now those are like teenagers in high school, but uh, she was with them just about a week or so ago and they haven't forgotten, have they? Oh. Amen. So anyway, uh, the reason I bring that up is that our elders do tremendous things in the church, and, and you don't hear much from them, but it's happening, and, uh, and, and the church is healthy because the leadership is healthy. Amen. How many of you know it starts at the top and it, and it comes down? And so this morning, uh, Elder Diane has a, a special word for the congregation. She let me know about a week ago that she did. I'm excited about it because it's always good, it's always edifying, it always builds us up. So if you would, stand once again and welcome our ministry gift today, Elder Diane Hagensek. Thank you. You can have a seat. All I can say is this is the right message from today, for today, because Everybody since praise and worship up till now has been trying to preach my message. So they've all been hearing. They all heard from the, from the Lord correctly. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's a glorious day. It's a wonderful day. It's a day the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. I thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to be in your, in your pulpit and, and bring a word forth because it's an honor and it's a mighty responsibility and I don't take it lightly. So before we start, let's pray. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continually be in my mouth. Lord, I pray, I praise you, I exalt you, I magnify your name, I declare that you are my most high God. And I thank you, Lord, that your word says that you use us to minister your word. So Father, I ask you now to make sure that I am ministering your word, the way you want it said, the way you want it delivered. And Holy Spirit, you prompt me to delete or to add what you feel necessary as I go along. Father, I thank you that this is a word in due season that you've given to me, that the ears are open and the minds are clear, and it will be planted deep into the hearts, fertile soil into all that hear it. And above all, I give you the praise and the glory and the honor because this is not my message, but it is your message, Father, that you're bringing through me. So I just thank you. I give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus, and it's through his blood that we all said, Amen. 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 All right, the name of my message, or the title is, Who Can Stop the Rain? There's a quick little story that I'm going to preface all this, and that is when I was sequestered, quarantine actually, when I had the flu in April, I was sitting in my chair, and I have my chair in my living room is my prayer chair. Because I look out my French doors, I got my birds here, I got my little whirly thingy there, and over in the distance are these tall Carolina pines and the winds blowing through the trees. And I just, when I see the wind blow, I know it's the wind, but my heart says, that's my God. So that's how, when I sit there, that's what goes through me. Well, that it happened to be a Wednesday night. There was a storm rolling in. And everybody in the media is saying, stay home, do not leave your house, the winds are high, the water's going to come up, it's going to rain, don't leave your house. So I'm sitting there, I'm watching it, and this voice says to me, who can stop the rain? Who can stop the rain? Who can stop the rain? And it wasn't once, it was like a two-year-old. God's not a two-year-old, but that's what it was like. Mommy, mommy. It was, who can stop the rain? Who can stop the rain? And I finally said, Lord, I can stop the rain. I can speak to that storm. I can stop the rain. And the voice went away, and I thought, well, I got it right. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. The next day I'm sitting there, and I'm not even doing anything spiritual. I'm just sitting in my chair. And this voice starts again. Who can stop the rain? 
who can stop the rain? Who can stop the rain, Diane? Who can stop the rain? And it went on, and it went on, and it went on. And I'm like, well, what kind of rain are you talking about? Are you talking about physical rain? Are you talking about Holy Spirit rain? Are you talking about blessings from heaven rain? The rain of a king? What kind of rain, Lord? And it just kept going, who can stop the rain? Who can stop the rain? And I got to the point that I was almost crying. And I said, Lord, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Show me what you want me to know. So if you want to know what the Lord wants you to know, you pull out your Bible, you sit down, and you wait. So that's what I did. So I pulled out my Bible, and I sat down, and I waited. And he gave me my answer. Well, when he gave me first was, was bugging me, encouraging me, I had texted Elder Darlene, and I said, the Lord keeps asking me who can stop the rain. Well, by the time I was out of quarantine, it was a, I think it was a Sunday night that we came and we were praying for intercessory prayer. And it was, was it Tuesday? It was Elder Darlene and I and the Snays. And so I happened to bring up the thing about the Lord saying that to me. Well, it just so happened that it was the beginning of prayer. Well, Elder Darlene had already gotten her message from God about who can stop the rain. And as we were going along praying, Donald got his message from the Lord about who can stop the rain because it's personal for each of us. And I would come to church and I'd ask different people, who can stop the rain? And you know, sometimes we have automated responses that we really don't think about. Because if I say God is good, you're going to say, and if I say all the time, you're going to say, but you haven't meditated on that. You don't, you're just saying a natural little response that we've been sort of conditioned to say without really thinking about it. So I'd ask people who can stop the rain and everybody would say, well, I can. And then I'd look at you all and I'd say, y'all need to meditate on that because there's something hidden in that. So this is what he shared with me and I'm going to bring it to you and I'm going to take you on a little journey that you're probably going to think, how is this all fitting together? But trust me, it will. So the first thing I did was I pulled out my Bible and he, referred, he told me that we can stop the rain, meaning the blessings of the Lord and actually the movement of the Holy Spirit because a lot of times they're intertwined. Because we don't know who we are, we don't practice who we are, and we don't speak who we are. We don't use the authority that God has placed in us. So he took me to Matthew 5, 45, and the section that I want to pull out of that is, God reigns on the just and the unjust alike. He's not just going to bless a believer. He blesses everybody. He reigns on everybody. So my question is, how am I going to make sure that I'm getting the rain and that unjust person isn't getting my rain? I want to make sure that my rain stays with me and somebody else isn't getting my portion. Because I want all my rain. Sometimes, you know, I've had believers in the past that go, well, I can't, I'm not believing. I'm, I'll take your part. I'll give, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll extend my faith and take what's yours. I will. Then he took me to Deuteron Deuteronomy 11, 8 through 17. And basically, and I'm going to paraphrase some of this for time. But it starts out, therefore be careful to obey every command I'm giving you today so you may have the strength to go in and take over their land you're about to enter. He was talking to the Israelites. They were getting prepared to go across the Jordan River into the, prom the promised land. And that it was not going to be the land that they were used to in Egypt. This was a special land. And that God was having a valley that had plenty of rain a land that the Lord your God cares for, that he watches over through each and every season, that you need to be careful to obey all the commands that he was giving you this day, that you love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and soul. Then he will send the rains in the proper seasons, the early and late rains, so that you can bring forth your harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil. And he will give you lush pasture lands for your livestock, and you yourselves will have all that you need to eat. But be careful 
Don't let your heart be deceived. Do not turn away from the Lord and serve and worship other gods. For if you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will shut up the sky and hold back the rain, and the ground will fail to reduce the harvest. Then you will quickly die in the good land that the Lord is giving you. That sort of sounds like part of the prophecy that we got for this year, eh? So there's kind of two parts to that. The first one is that we need to obey the, the commandment or the obey the word of God. And the second part is rain is necessary if you're going to get a harvest. And to get that rain, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. You need to serve him and you need to worship him only and not be deceived by other gods. So when I looked at that and I studied it and I let it roll around, basically what it said to me is, if you're not prepared, if you aren't fit for the master's use, if you don't practice diligent, then you will stop the rain. You will stop the new and great things this year, and you will stop the accelerated harvest because you have not done your part, which is also laid out in the prophecy. It says you have to be faithful. So I'm going to take you on a little journey to a parable that you probably have never quite looked at the way I'm going to show it to you. And it's in John 5, verses 1 through 9. And after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, there's a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, stirred up the water, then whosoever stepped in first after the stirring was made well by whatever diseases he had. Now there was a certain man there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? And the man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the rain comes, or excuse me, when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now, prior to Jesus arriving in Jerusalem, he had already been performing miracles. He'd already turned water into wine. He'd already turned um, the meal with the fishes and the loaves and fed all those people. So his fame had gone before him. But the interesting thing about this, if you read all the way to the end, this man had not heard a thing about Jesus. He did not know who Jesus was. Because at the end of the story, the, the Pharisees said, well, who healed you? He goes, I don't know. Some man came up to me and told me something. He had no clue who had spoken to him. The other thing about this verse in the beginning is that the water in Bethesda could not heal if it was still. It had to be stirred up. It had to be troubled. Which kind of tells me that sometimes we need to come to this church. We need to hear a message that will stir us up and shake us up a little bit in order for us to make changes in our lives. If Pastor Mike gets up here and all he preaches is friendly, user-friendly messages and he doesn't challenge us with the word, we're all going to stay the same. We're never going to grow. He's got to speak the word to us if we're going to grow and mature. As Brother Adonis tells us, we need to expand our capacity. Well, we can't do that with a little bit of resistance or a little bit of something. If you're going to expand and grow, there's going to be some resistance that's going to come against you that you have to use and flex some muscles, flex some faith to have that happen. Amen? So here's this man. 38 years he's lying on this mat. He's sitting. He's waiting. He's watching. He's sitting. He's waiting. He's watching. He might hope here and there, but he's sitting. He's waiting, and he's watching. Now, if that were me, I could tell you right now, I'd be halfway off that edge of that pool ready to flop in the minute that water started. But here's this man. He's just laying there. Number one, 
he had no longer, he no longer had any interest in making changes to his own mat, his circumstance, his circumference, AKA his life. He was no longer interested in that. He had begun to focus all of his attention on wanting somebody else to come and make something happen for him. In each of us, there needs to come a time in our lives, especially, I'm talking spiritual life, but it can also be your just natural life, that we need to make the decision to make a change. Other people, they can't make that happen for you. And speaking on a, on a church level, as a church, we need to make a change as far as where we are and what we're doing in the ministry involved that we are involved in. If you're in landscaping or the yard, or if you're greeting people at the door, if you're an usher, if you're in hospitality, if you're on praise and worship, you are all responsible for setting your own standard of excellence. I can't set that standard for you. God showed me very well that, you know, you can't do that. Now, I can do that if you're a child, because with those chosen champions before we performed, I would say, this is where we're going to go. And we're not going to perform, and not, we're not going to do anything till we reach this standard. And you can ask them. I would tell them, you don't have to be perfect, but you have to have excellence. And that's what they do. They, they would reach excellence every single time. But when you come to be an adult, that decision has to be yours. And for a body of church, if we want as a body to grow, to go to the next level, we all have to raise up our standard of excellence and decide that's where we're going. We can't let everybody else like this man come and oh, well, I'm going to carry you. I'm going to be your crutch. I'm going to help you along. No, we all have to step up into what is our responsibility, be adults and say, this is what I'm going to do. Now, like I said, I, can't, I can do that to a child, but I can't do that to somebody else. So we look at this, and here's Jesus, and he walks in, and of all the people sitting around this pool, he focuses on one man. We don't know why he focused on that one man. We don't know if he healed anybody else but that one man. But he looks at this one man and he says to him, do you want to be healed? Now I read this and I'm thinking, well, duh. He's been laying there for 38 years. Of course he wants to be healed. But you know, God doesn't put, ask stupid questions. There's a reason behind this. It'd be like me saying to someone who has cancer, do you want to be healed? Or if you've been, con you know, drug challenges, do you want to be clean? We're all going to say, yes, yes. So Jesus says to the man, do you want to be healed? The man dismissed his question. Instead, he gave complaints and excuses. He said, I ain't got nobody. I'm lame. I'm sick, I'm, I'm slow and I'm disabled. I don't have any family, I don't have any friends. The problem with him was his attitude. Think about it, how can you get healed hanging around sick people all the time? You can't, you can't spend 38 years hanging around somebody sick, around the pool, you don't really ever move because you can't move. And you're stuck there. And all you hear from all these hundreds of people is, oh, my back aches, oh, my, you know, all day long, in and out. How can you extend your faith for healing? Just like if you hang around negative people all the time, you're going to get negative. If you hang around somebody depressed, woe is me, you're going to get depressed. If you hang around somebody that gossips and stirs the pot, you're going to turn into a gossiper. That's just the way it is. Birds of a feather, it's true. You need to surround yourself with godly, prayerful men and women who have a vision, a vision that's, I'm moving forward. You need to be around people who talk about stuff that you don't know a thing about because you're going to learn something. 
You're going to grow. You don't want to be the smartest student in a class. I heard a preacher on TV say that. Because if you're the smartest student in the class, you've outgrown your class. You can't learn. If you meet with people and you're not the designated teacher, but as you're sitting there and you go to a study and you're always the teacher, you need a new circle because you've outgrown that circle. It's like a fish in a pond. When I built my first house, I had this nice little plastic fish pond from Lowe's and little waterfall. And, and I went out and got two little goldfish that were an inch long. I threw them into that pond. They grew to about four inches long, and then they were hindered by the pond. They couldn't get any bigger. Now, some little critter in the neighborhood enjoyed them, but they couldn't get any bigger. <laughs> went out one morning, and they were gone. <laughs> so somebody enjoyed them. But this man, his companions on the pool, they hindered him from getting his healing. Once again, you can't get healed hanging around with sick people. That's why when Jesus asked him, instead of answering him, yes, he whined about his life. He was living in the, well, as soon as life. And you can't live there. He was, as soon as I get into the water, my problems, they're going to be solved. As soon as someone helps me, I'm going to be healed. As soon as Monday comes, I'm going to start watching what I eat and I'm going to exercise. As soon as my household settles down and those kids are running everywhere, I can find time to pray. As soon as I'm not so busy at work, I can spend more time in the Word. As soon as I have more money, I can tithe. Guess what my question to you is? Do you want to be healed? Why wait? Do you want to be healed? But sometimes, maybe you haven't noticed it, but being in the health field, I notice these things. Sick people, there are some people, they love being sick. They thrive on being sick. It gives them something to complain about. It gives them something for other people to focus on them about. Oh, you poor thing, pat, pat, rub, rub. Oh, I'm so sad for you. They live on their own little mat, and everybody else caters to them. They don't want to take the responsibility that comes with the healing or the changes that they're going to have in their life. They're scared. Think about this man. For 38 years, he's laid there, and if he gets healed all of a sudden, he's got to get a job. He's got to start being accountable to things. He's got to learn how to socialize with people that are normal because all he knows is sick people. He doesn't know how to speak a normal conversation because he's never spent time with anybody that's upbeat, has a good thing to say. He's just listened to, oh, woe is me, for 38 years. That could be scary. But you know what? We all have the same excuses when it comes to getting blessed by God. Pastor alluded to it, or Elder Stan, one or the other, when they said, you read something in the Bible and you think it's too good to be true. Some of us say, God, you can't bless me. I'm in a rotten marriage. That man or that woman, they don't treat me right. How is he going to bless me in a marriage like this? Or if you're a child, and your home is broken, you're like, my parents treat me horribly. They kick me out of the house every time you turn around. How can God heal me in a house like that? Or you got a job that you think, you know, everybody there hates me. Those people are wicked. That boss of mine, I can't trust him at all. How is God going to bless me in a situation like that? Or if you've got children and they're not living the way you want them to live. Those heathen kids, I don't know what's going to happen to them. They don't treat me right. I'm their mother. But how's God going to bless me with that? I would suggest that you all come away from the Walmart complaint counter and you come to the Word of God counter. Because let's see what Jesus did to that situation. Jesus didn't listen to the... I mean, he heard him. He did not acknowledge his response. He looked at that man and he spoke life into him. 
He said, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Don't lie there feeling sorry for yourself. Rise, take up your mat, and walk. Jesus didn't lay his hands on him. He didn't anoint him with oil. He didn't put him in the pool. The pool didn't heal him. What healed him was this is what we're getting to in all this. Jesus already gave him the power in his word to do it. The power was in his word to rise, pick up your mat, and walk. So here's this man. He's got two choices. Well, he's got one choice, actually. Do I? This man comes to me. He gives me a command. He doesn't assure me of anything. I don't know if I'm going to get healed. He doesn't promise me anything. So do I take this man and do what he tells me to do, or do I stay where I am? We can either make excuses, or we can make progress. So we need to stop whining, no more excuses, no more waiting, no more quitting, no more watching. Rise, take up your mat and walk. Rise, pick up your faith and go. Rise, take up, go. You're stronger. The more you walk, the stronger you're going to get. The stronger you're going to get, you're going to get some wisdom. And next thing you know, you're going to be running. So rise, get up off your mat, and walk. And when you go, guess what? Your circumstances will go with you. That's the one thing here. This man, he didn't leave his mat behind him. His circumstances went with him. And the reason for that is because God changes you from the inside out. He doesn't change you from the outside in. So if you're in a situation, you don't like your circumstances, if you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is speaking the word of God, focusing on the word of God, the power of that word comes from inside you and it will change your circumstances. So in this case, the man was carrying his circumstances, they weren't carrying him. Come on. Come on. Get that? So how do we change our circumstances? By the power that he gave us in his word. We are able, as Pastor Mike said Wednesday night, we are able to obtain and receive every provision if we hear it and we believe it. If we believe the word, it builds up our faith to receive, and then we've got it. I'm going to quickly do this. When I was, lear- when I was getting this word from the Lord, he took me to Hebrews 11. And when I was, um, Hebrews, James, come on. And I had never noticed this before. But we get past the faith as the substance of things hoped for. But if you start looking at verse 3 to the end of the chapter, by faith we understand the entire universe was formed. By faith, Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God. By faith, Enoch was taken up to heaven. By faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, Abraham left his family. By faith, Sarah had a child. All of these people died believing what God had promised them by faith, by faith. As all the times I read that, it wasn't till just, it was like it jumped off the page. All these things, it was by faith. We have the same power in the word that Jesus spoke when he said, rise, take up your mat, and walk. You know, Life and death is in the power of our tongue. And if you're speaking the word, then the power is going to come out of you. You know, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and the Holy Spirit is the glory of the Lord. And if you've got the glory living inside of you, when you open your mouth, what has to come out? Glory. 
Glory's got to come out your mouth. If it's in line with the word of God, I mean, if you're not speaking the word, it's not going to be glory. But if you're speaking the word of God, that is glory. That's the anointing. That is coming out your mouth. That changes your circumstance. That changes your life. Now, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, shows us that David was discouraged. We've already kind of heard this. And he stirred himself up in the Lord by remembering the covenant promises, which to us this day are provision. And he spoke those promises. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4.13 that David's creed was, I believed and therefore I spoke. We have that exact same faith that David has. Therefore, we can speak and we can expect what we speak to come to pass. Now, I um, got a free CD from George Pearson's. Um, it's Kenneth Copeland Ministry, and you can go to their website, and they have oodles and boodles of free things. And I don't even remember asking for this, but it came in the mail. And I got a big got box of goodies, and they ship it to you free of charge. But these confessions are, he calls them his power confessions, and they tell you who you are, what you have, and what you can do. Now, I listen to this when I'm getting dressed in the morning. I listen to this on the way to work. And more times than not, I listen to it on the way home from work. But because of time, I'm just going to give you a few things that are on this. And if any of you want a CD, it is yours, free for the taking. And you can just come on up and get yourself one. So, who are we in Christ? You are a new creature in Christ. What you did last week, what you did yesterday that didn't line up with the word of God, if you said, Father, I'm sorry, please forgive me, he now sees you pure as the driven snow. He sees you as his spotless child of God, white. He sees you through the blood of Jesus. He doesn't see you as you, but through the blood of Jesus, he goes, oh, look at her, look at Miss Colleen, look at how good she's looking today. She's pure. She's spotless. That's my daughter. He says you are healed by his stripes. You don't have to walk around being sick. You don't have to walk about, you know, I've had this for years. You don't have to have that for years. Because his word says who you are in Christ is that you are the healed of the Lord. That you're more than a conqueror. You overcome every situation in this land. Every situation that you face. Think about it. You are like the Israelis as they were camped next to the Jordan River. You are that close to your promised land if you just do not grow weary. They were right there. Right there. And you are bold as a lion. You are not a little wimpy thing. So when something's coming against you, you need to roar. Now, if you were my chosen champions, I'd make you roar right now, but I'm not going to. You are strong in faith, and you should be giving your glory to God. And because of Jesus' death on the cross, we can claim, I can say, I have Abraham's blessing. These are mine. But I wouldn't have them if Jesus hadn't died. You are like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You bring forth fruit in your season, and your leaf, it's not going to wither. And whatever you put your hand to, it will prosper. And I like the little added. That Cappy, what's his name? That's it, Cappy Caldwell. When he has this little book, it says, and God causes even your mistakes to prosper. Think about it. When you happen to make the wrong decision about something and you go to him, he's going to say, okay, honey, I'll fix it. Think about that. That's my God. That's my daddy. That's what my daddy does for me. I have the ability you have the ability to come to the throne of God. You don't have to go to somebody else. Now, if you need, you need an extra person, you go to the pastor. And you, but if you're sitting at home and something's coming up against you and you can't get a hold of the pastor, you don't have time, it's, you can say, Father God, I have a problem. I need you. You don't have to wait for somebody else. You can do it on your own. He opened that veil. He said, come on in. And then he fills you with the peace of God. When you know that you've had your decision, 
you've got a peace in, that settles on you that you know that you know. You don't have to sit there and worry and think about it anymore. You just know that you got it. And then joy, unspeakable, rises up against you, up, up inside you, not against you. It might if you need a little something, something might be against you, but it rises up in you and you're going to have the strength to go on. And more, you've got the love of God. When that person is vexing you, you just got to say, I've got the love of God in me. You've got godly wisdom and the ability to understand that wisdom. Proverbs says that God lays up wisdom for his own. Well, I'm alone, so I got wisdom. You have the tongue of the learned. That means you can speak the word to somebody else if it's in there to be spoken. Just saying. You've got the spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Now you can minister God's word. I'm up here today ministering God's word because he gives me the ability to do that. I'm not doing it on my own because I didn't think this up. It was something that came from him. You are always triumphant in Christ. Doesn't matter what's pushing against you. It's trying to stomp you down. He gives you a platform of victory. We have all heard that, but we, we are victorious. We might kind of stagger like a weeble, but if you don't fall down, you're going to be triumphant. You walk by faith, not sometimes. You walk by faith all the time. You can lay hands on the sick, and you should expect them to recover. Yes. I work in the recovery room, and I have to tell you that probably at least 50% of my patients are women who have miscarried and have had to have surgery because of that. I get them almost all of the time. And they'll sit there, and they'll wake up, and they're good, and then they hit that certain point where all of a sudden anesthesia's almost gone, and the reality of the loss and the disappointment that they were hoping for, it hits them, and they start sobbing every time. And I sit there, and I hold their hand, and I tell them it's going to be okay. And I sit there, and I hold their hand. And then eventually the point comes where I can say, would you like me to pray for you? And not once has anybody ever told me no. And then I, I lay hands on them, and I speak life into their bodies. I tell them that they are going to have the peace of God that surrounds them, that he is going to comfort them, that he loves them, that they are going to get the desires of their heart, that he promises you the desire of your heart. And I put my hand on their uterus and I say, and you have a healed and, uter healed and fertile uterus. And when the time has come, that seed will be planted and you will have brought to fruition the desire of your heart. And then we get done, we say amen, and then I look at them and I say, do not let go of the desire in your heart. Do not let it go because it will come to pass. And they all look at me and they're like, they've gone from sorrow to, they've got hope. There's now hope sitting in them. You can lead other people to Jesus. That's something that we're all kind of stretching our arms and expanding our capacity this year. But we all have the ability to lead somebody to Jesus. We have the authority to use his name to overcome everything. Sickness, disease, poverty, it doesn't matter what it is. Just say the name of Jesus. That's, that, that song says it all. Say the name of Jesus. If you believe, all things are possible. For the Lord, he is your helper. You shall not fear what man shall do to you. Now, I was going to end this with Psalm 112. So I'm telling you, everybody was preaching my soul. And, it's, and this is turned into a confession. So I would like you all to stand to your feet, and we're going to confess Psalm 112, and then we'll just be about done. I'm going to say it, and then you repeat after me. Praise ye the Lord. I am blessed because I fear the Lord. I delight greatly in the word. I delight greatly in the word. As a result, As a result my, seed is mighty upon the earth. my seed is mighty upon the earth. The upright generation is blessed. 
Wealth and riches are in my house. My right standing with God endures forever. I receive light in the darkness. I am gracious and full of compassion. I am right standing with God. I show favor and I lend. I guide, I guard, excuse me, let me get this right. I guide all my affairs with discretion. I shall not be moved. I always remember my covenant. I am not afraid of evil tidings. My heart is fixed. Trusting in the Lord. My heart is established. I am not afraid. I see my desire upon my enemy. I'm a generous sower and I give to the poor. God promotes me with honor. The enemy, he is grieved by what he sees. He gets mad. And he slithers away. The desire of the devil, it comes to nothing. My house cannot be shaken. Say it one more time. My house cannot be shaken. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Now, if you, if you get nothing else from this message today, this is the one thing I want you to remember. When something's coming against you, when you're going through something, I want you to muster up all the faith that you have and you say, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. Thank you.